Welcome once again to Washington and Me. I'm your host, George Blaze. You know, one of the most challenging things about doing a program like this, trying to keep up with what's going around in news and politics and social issues is things are changing from hour to hour and day to day. So we do the best we can uh, to try and stay on top of it and to try to be relevant. Um, but as you say, as of recording the show, who knows, two days from now when it airs, Maybe, maybe in a completely different situation, but we're gonna to try to do the best we can. Today joining me is someone you should all know and love. He's an artist, a musician, a journalist, executive director of Democracy Watch News, Mark Taylor Canfield. Mark, it's good to talk to you today. George, thanks for having me on the show. I really appreciate it. I like what you guys do. Well, I, I, I'm surely you can appreciate um, with everything you do across the board, just trying to keep up with you know what's going on in news, trying to keep up with independent media. It's an hour by hour struggle out here. Every day, uh, that's one of the slogans of the Seattle protest scene is every day. There's a march every morning and a march every evening. And last night, uh, the Seattle Police Department was using gas and flashbang grenades, and pepper spray again on demonstrators, which after two major lawsuits, a uh, court uh, restraining order and a city council ordinance trying to ban these munitions, the Seattle police, like the Portland police, just seem to love to use that tear gas. It's like they, it's like that line from Apocalypse Now. You know, they love the smell of tear gas in the morning for some reason in these two cities. So they use it every opportunity they get. And last night, they used it uh, outside the Washington State Patrol headquarters in Seattle near I-5, where they basically dispersed the crowd using those munitions. Well, it seems like, you know, Mark, there was a time maybe maybe th two or three weeks ago when I said to myself, you know, if things can just quiet down a little bit, um, there'll be a tipping point we won't get past where we can start to move forward to actually start to actually see some changes happening, see some things actually going on that are gonna fix things. Um, but now as I'm looking at what's going on in Seattle, if you look at Portland, if you look at Minneapolis, if you look at Chicago, I, I think we're at a point now where I don't, I don't see how we're gonna get back. Well, one of the major topics of discussion today on the Democracy Watch News press briefing, our national press briefing every Thursday, was the situation in Kenosha, Wisconsin, where unfortunately another name has been added to the list of people of color being killed by police, Jacob Blake. So uh, a couple of, uh, there was also a shooting in Kenosha at the protest where two protesters were killed here in Seattle, uh, unfortunately, I happened to be on the freeway covering uh, a protest on Interstate 5 when a woman was struck by a car and later died. So it's been uh, some tragic circumstances um, surrounding this whole issue from beginning to end. And people still, though, are taking to the streets because they feel like there's hope in solidarity and activism and that the only way things are going to change is if... Uh, feet are out there marching. So in Seattle, there's a list of demands that the protesters have communicated to the city, including a 50% defunding of the Seattle Police Department, which after you see the Seattle Times article showing that 374 Seattle police officers made over $200,000 in salary uh, last check, uh, yeah, there might be some um, budget cuts available there. However, our mayor, Jenny Durkin, has uh, vetoed the city council proposal to cut 100 police officers' jobs. Um, and now we have an outgoing police chief, Carmen Best, uh, first female African-American woman as chief of police in Seattle. So a historic moment. I was there when she was sworn in. I was actually playing some music uh, for the city council at the city council hearing about trying to save our famous showbox theater, a famous music venue here where folks like Duke Ellington and Muddy Waters have played. But I saw her swear in, she, she heard my music and liked it. We, you know, had great hopes for Seattle and police reform. However, our uh, city council member, Shama Sawant, who's a member of the Al Socialist Alternative Party, she said at that time that she really didn't think that the racism uh, is, was going to be rooted out of the police department, even with Carmen Best as police chief. And if you talk a lot uh, to a lot of the activists in Seattle who are marching every day, and the Black Lives Matter movement folks, you, they would probably agree with that. Um, but she has announced her resignation. Uh, Mayor Jenny Durkin's resignation has also been demanded by the protesters after over 15,000 complaints 
or filed against the Seattle Police Department during recent protests. But as a journalist, I always find it uh, ironic that that particular fact, the the amazing number of complaints that have been filed against the police department is never something that uh, Chief Police Chief of Police Carmen Best or Mayor Jenny Durkin address during their press briefings. It's almost as if that issue just doesn't exist. But that's one of the reasons why so many people are marching. It, it would seem that, you know, maybe, you know, they view the number of complaints coming in almost as like a, you know, like a living DDoS attack on them, that it's not real. They're just flooding the gates with complaints just to give a, another reason um, to keep fomenting unrest, to keep uh, the chaos going. But w when we look at situations, not only in Seattle, but I, I think what, what was going on in Minneapolis the other night um, was particularly telling because uh, shout out um, to a bunch of independent media producers who were live streaming the whole thing in Minneapolis. You saw a situation where um, an individual committed suicide on the street. I saw the video myself. Um, rumors went out that it was a police-involved shooting. Um, there was a little bit of unrest, but then the Minneapolis Police Department came downtown like hell, hell's bells, spraying people, macing people, and that's what kicked off what became an all-night event. And it's like these kind of escalations. At this point, it would seem like all police departments would be briefed on, we're trying to de-escalate as much as possible. Uh, just a couple of years ago here in Seattle, during the the traditional May Day riots, uh, our own uh, city council member and head of the public safety committee, uh, a black man, Bruce Harrell, said that the police started the riot. They went into a perfectly peaceful protest that was marching down Broadway on Capitol Hill and violently arrested uh, two activists. So uh, we are shocked to see down in Portland, uh, the riot kitchen folks, the people who have been distributing free food to the protesters they were actually uh, uh, arrested by a gun-wielding group of people in unmarked vans um, with no identification, turn, who they think may be federal police, but uh, they broke the windows of their car after blocking them at the intersection and pulled them out and arrested them. We also saw police breaking the window of a car last night. Uh, that was one of the escort cars of the protest near Interstate 5, uh, they literally just broke the window right there on the live stream. Uh, and uh, Omari Shaughnessy's live stream that you could see, they just broke the window and then they pulled the driver out. So that seems to be a new tactic that's happening too, is uh, about a week ago, Seattle police were actually stopping cars trying to leave a protest in the international district here and arresting people. So, you know, the, I don't see much de-escalation going on. The whole point, uh, that Bruce Harrell was trying to make that day was that if the police hadn't acted violently, then there would not have been a riot that night. What kind of tangible, what tangibles do the people of Seattle need from the police department at this point um, to try and pull things back a little bit? Is there anything tangibly that could happen um, that can start to cool the fans here? Um, well, maybe the politicization, the politicization of the police department um, is one of the problems um, that I noted as a journalist with Police Chief Best um, and some of the police officers who have political views, which they tend to express sometimes, which I think is you know probably highly pr unprofessional for a police officer, just like it would be you know a doctor or or sometimes a journalist or someone you know to try to prejudice people when you're doing your professional work. But uh, other than that, I mean, they really need to adopt this attitude that the city council is promoting, including city council president Lorena Gonzalez, uh, Shama Sawant, uh, the uh, budget committee chairperson Teresa Mosquedo, is uh, they need to embrace the demilitarization of police in Seattle. Ever since the WTO protests and then a lot of the DEA federal grants on, during the war on drugs, uh, there's been a lot of investment in uh, paramilitary style uh, weapons and equipment in police departments around the country. And Seattle was one of the models for that during the demonstrations, the massive demonstrations against the World Trade Organization Ministerial Conference in 1999. So people in Seattle are very familiar with the armored personnel carriers and the RoboCop looking um, police with riot sticks in um, body armor. Um, I think one of the messages from the city council is that when the police show up looking that way, they have already incited a lot of anger and resistance. So uh, 
maybe not a good stance to take at the very outset of every protest in Seattle, which is what they still seem to continue doing. Now, Mark, obviously you and I are old enough uh, to kind of, kind of remember this turning point, what they call the Battle of Seattle at the WTO, which actually the tactics the police suddenly instituted then were reflective of what had gone on the last meeting in Europe. There was a meeting in Italy, I believe, where um, it was the first time you saw independent journalists and, and protesters getting shot on the streets, at least during the 90s. And we've kind of seen it carry over through these you know, WTO protests across the world. Um, it would seem like lessons were learned at that point. Like, how did we get back here? Well, there was a lot of investment um, in militarized gear for police. There were uh, sweet deals offered by the federal government uh, for local police departments to work with the military and uh, to get used military equipment, which is probably where some of the CS gas comes from, which, by the way, was banned by the Geneva Convention during times of war as a chemical weapon. Um, but, you know, this issue of tear gas, pepper spray, rubber bullets, uh, flashbang grenades, concussion grenades, whatever you want to call them, they were used during the WTO demonstrations. They've been used almost every May Day <laughs> over the last decade or so in Seattle, although the last few May Days were actually relatively peaceful, I think, because uh, people started to realize that, you know, the real battle at that time was, was coming from the folks in the White House. But now we have a situation where the police uh, are heavily militarized. They act like a paramilitary unit. They're heavily armed. They show up uh, looking like a SWAT team, even when they're just, you know, routine off patrol officers. Now, there are the bicycle police, and I believe Seattle was one of the first cities to actually institute a bicycle squad. And they, you know, tends to be a lot less, you know, um, in intimidating in terms of the way they look. However, they can be very aggressive, too. And they often use them as what they call an emphasis squad. So my take on all of this, having been at the Seattle WTO demonstrations, that was my first experience of Seattle as a young man, was I walked into Seattle and riot cops, you know, banging their uh, batons against their shields and staring at me like they wanted to beat me up. I'm thinking, wow, this is, uh, I guess, corporate fascism. This is what it looks like. I don't know. But since then, there have been battles by, from the, coming from the ACLU, Amnesty International, the Trial Lawyers for Public Justice, the NAACP, the Urban League, all sorts of um, civil rights groups, which led to a federal uh, Department of Justice review of the Seattle Police Department for excessive use of force and racial profiling. They're still under a consent decree, uh, which was part of uh, the result of that review. So there's still federal oversight um, happening of the Seattle Police Department. And it all started with, um, well, it didn't start, but it came to a head during the sh uh, shooting of a Native American woodcarver. His name is John T. Williams. There are two large totem poles in Seattle dedicated to him. That officer was never prosecuted. The Seattle Times went on to do an investigative journalism survey of cases in Washington State. They found that out of 200 police shootings, only one officer had ever been prosecuted. So in a recent round of elections, this the folks in Washington state passed an initiative, which makes it a little bit easier for prosecutors to actually charge police officers. And so the first uh, sort of test case is happening right now. It's an Auburn police officer, and he has been charged with second degree murder. Um, but up until now, it's been very, very rare, if almost non-existent for police officers to be prosecuted for crimes uh, while on, the, on duty. So I think that the mayor, the office of the mayor, the uh, city council, and other political representatives in the city never adequately addressed any of these issues after the WTO demonstrations, where there were mass violations of people's civil rights and a no protest zone was declared. Uh, at one point, gas masks were made illegal. Uh, my band has a song about that, the ballad of, of Seattle. So there's a whole uh, history of uh, policing in Seattle that's never been addressed. Um, finally, there was a Department of Justice review, but a lot of people would say that they haven't seen a lot of evidence of, of reform at this point. Well, it doesn't seem like uh, any of the protesting is going to come to an end anytime soon, certainly not before Election Day. I, I mean, as we do the road to November here is, is the title of this episode. Um, have you had a chance to watch any of either convention, the Democratic National Convention, or the RNC that's going on as we speak? Yes, it's one of the duties of being a journalist. 
as you know, as well as a musician, because you know I can write about some of these people. But I feel like, um, it's, you know, in Seattle, where progressive politics tends to reign, um, it's been a very lackluster year in terms of politics. But I think people, there's you know extenuating circumstances, of course, for all of this. Luckily, we have uh, mail-in voting, and you can actually even drop off your ballot at the at the same time in Martin Luther King Jr. County, where I live in Seattle. So we do have some protections for our vote here. Um, but I think people are, are worried. And, you know, we interviewed Greg Pallas, great investigative journalist for Democracy Watch News, our podcast, Democracy Cast. And he gave a great expose about his book on how the Republicans are trying to steal this next election. Um, we've also seen voter suppression during primaries in the Democratic Party. So it's not just one party that's been caught doing that. People are very worried about our democracies, starting with the Electoral College, uh, the Citizens United decision, um, the gerrymandering that's gone on all across the country, and then a lot and of Mark, the Mark, Mark, I think you make a, a very great point there that I think a lot of people who don't do the work, the kind of work that you and I do, um, don't really understand, uh, particularly when you go back to the last election cycle. Um, there was a gentleman by the name of Dr. Willie Wilson out of Chicago who was uh, trying to run for, for, for president as well. And while he was out spending his own money, he's an independent millionaire, spending his own money out campaigning, um, he was reporting back that simple things like sharing of the VANS system, which is kind of like a voter database that the whole Democratic Party gets to use as long as you're a registered Democrat, um, they were locking him out of that. The Hillary Clinton campaign was locking him out of basic tools and basic things just to be part of a process. And they're all supposed to be on the same team. So when we look at, you're talking about voter suppression, it's not just one side or the other. Politics is, you know, if you knew how sausage was made, you wouldn't need it. According to Greg Pallast, over 500,000 votes were disqualified in California during the primary election uh, when Senator Bernie Sanders was running against Hillary Clinton. So, yeah, I mean, we, uh, Bernie Sanders is very popular in this part of the state, in this part of the country. His uh, Tacoma Dome show, including the band Portugal the Man, some great hip hop artists and a Native American prayer ceremony. It was one of the most incredible political events I've ever seen. People really like Bernie Sanders here. They do not like what the DNC has done to try to push progressives out of the party and to keep a, a sort of corporatist agenda. So, you know, you can bet that here in Seattle and Washington State and Martin Luther King Jr. County, there will always be a progressive movement to bring more progressives into the Democratic Party and to push the Democrats to finally uh, nominate someone who actually is representative of most of the people in this country and is willing to take on a more FDR style progressive agenda for the future because this country is really suffering right now on many levels and we need that, that style of leadership, I think, at this point. There seems to, uh, at least uh, Speaker Pelosi has put out a call that Biden shouldn't even debate Trump in this cycle, that it would just be uh, an exercise in skullduggery, I believe she referred to it. Uh, what do you think about that? Well, that's concerning to me because as executive director for Democracy Watch News, one of my uh, interests is uh, pro-democracy movements around the world. And uh, seeing how our democracy has already been under the stranglehold of corporate money and big time lobbyists and, and special interests, I really have a hard time with this idea that the two potential leaders uh, of our nation would not be willing to actually stand up on stage and go toe to toe. Um, that's part of democracy. Uh, I think some of the major issues of our country have been, um, have, have found some kind of resolution through major debates that took, took place across the country. And I would say at this point, the more dialogue, the better. So I'm concerned about that. But there are many things, you know, about our democracy I'm concerned about. That's not necessarily number one, but it's up there. What are, what are the major things that are on your mind? I mean, we're moving into probably the most uh, contentious and important election cycle in my adult life, for sure. Uh, what, what's on your mind? What are your top things? Well, I'm also editor for, for Press Freedom for Democracy Watch News. The United States is currently ranked 45th in the world in terms of press freedom. And there's been a lot of uh, support from the Federal Communications Commission 
for corporate media um, ownership consolidation so that only a few very powerful uh, multinationals own the media. Um, we've seen the politicization of the media and uh, freedom of the press is something that's really suffering in the United States right now. Um, that's one issue. You can't have a free election if you don't have a free press. Um, this, luckily, the Seattle City Council just passed a resolution uh, in favor of protecting journalists from being targeted by police because there have been a lot of reports of journalists and, you know, I, I myself have been pepper sprayed and had, you know, pepper balls fired at me and things, um, tear gassed, you know, rubber bullets during protests. Um, but there's been a move to protect journalists. I've always been pushing for a resolution in Seattle to declare Seattle a sanctuary city for journalism where, you know, you're not subject to arrest. And as I mentioned, the Citizens United decision, which has equated money with free speech, which has turned, you know, a lot of our elections over to uh, those with the most money win. We've got uh, the Electoral College, which, you know, does, you know, Donald Trump was not elected by the majority of the popular vote in the United States. That's really hard for me to explain to my colleagues in other parts of the world uh, that, oh, wait, I was talking to my friend from West Africa and the Gambia. He's saying, well, wait, what is this popular uh, vote versus the electoral college? Who are these electors? It's very difficult to explain to people who think that the United States is supposed to be a democracy why the popular vote is, is not giving us a president. Also, um, we have all sorts of issues with voter suppression, as I mentioned, and now this attack on the postal system, which is our sort of last bastion of hope during this election season is, you know, um, being tampered with. And suspiciously, you know, people are, are, are trying to cover it up. And I think that there is a general consensus amongst a lot of people in the country that uh, it is a, some sort of a conspiratorial effort to influence the election and make it more difficult for people to vote. We really need some healing in this country and this polarization has got to stop the extremism and the propaganda which is trying to uh, stir up more dissent and, and more anger and more hatred has got to stop. It's really, I'm just hoping that at some point cooler heads will prevail because that's really what needs to happen. And in this environment, of course, uh, one of the things that's so important, so important to me is we do have a lot of robust, very brave, independent uh, news media people out there. They're using Periscope, they're using Twitch, they're using all the tools at their disposal to live stream stuff that the mainstream media will not report on. Uh, shout out to Unicorn Riot last night. Um, hours and hours of footage from Minneapolis that mm -hmm. if you don't watch uh, Unicorn Riot's coverage of that, you have no idea what was actually going on there. Well, you know, the corporate news uh, reporters, they show up, they get their 10 second sound bite, and then they're out of there. They're more concerned about their makeup and the hairspray and the what suit they're wearing, you know. so. It's a different kind of journalism. The alternative media journalists, they show up, they stay all night, they breathe the tear gas and the pepper spray with the protesters. They take heat from both sides and they stay in there and fight for freedom of the press. And I'm really, I'm really impressed by those people who are willing to put themselves on the line um, to communicate the truth to people. Because without that, as you said, without the live streamers, I mean, how could I do my job? I'm here in Seattle. I mean, I can go and cover what's happening here, but I obviously cannot, you know, hop a trip across the country to Minneapolis and then, you know, go over to Kenosha and see what's happening there. But with the help of the live streamers, I'm able to bring my audience and the people who follow us at Democracy Watch News and people in the Pacific Northwest information about what's happening in other parts of the country that they wouldn't normally get. If somebody hadn't gone out there, he's probably not getting paid. Or if they are very little, you know, might, they might have a, um, a GoFundMe site or something, um, a Patreon site they just get out there and do it because it's important and i love to work with people who do journalism because it's a mission for them and they think that it's important somebody's got to do it like i said you know i you know i don't want to name any names but there's some people who honestly I, I used to really like and enjoy a lot um but they put some opinion and stuff and now i'm not sure where they sit i think about people like tim pool is one used to be one of my favorite and I, I just don't know where tim's at right now um just because he's been criticized or he's found himself in bad situations while he's reporting doesn't mean all of a sudden now you're, you're a Trump supporter. Like, I, I just, stuff like that bothers me. It's like, you were doing a great job and now you've chosen a side and it just, it, it, it messes up your, your perspective. All I can say, George, is beware sometimes of people who become very popular because their politics can change. And I've seen it many times with journalists. Um, I tend to trust the journalists who 
don't make the most money, who work hard um, and are a little hungry. Uh, there's, I'm not saying that, you know, I mean, Tim is welcome to his political views, but uh, yeah, I don't, I don't understand where he's coming from some of the time. There are some people who are trying to find some convergence between the left and the right, but they end up in a very confusing place that is full of contradictions. So um, there are, luckily there are plenty of other people out there. There, there was another uh, person whose name I won't mention, who was also very popular as a Bernie Sanders supporter, who now is, a, is you know, getting you know, hundreds of thousands of viewers um, on YouTube to doing pro-Trump stuff. So sometimes people go where the audience is as well. I have to admit that, That's that true. I've seen that many times, especially in corporate media. Well, Mark Taylor Canfield, Executive Director of Democracy Watch News, thank you for all the work you're doing. You're one of the good guys out here. I'll do everything I can to share and spread everything you're doing. Follow on Twitter, on Facebook, everywhere else. And hopefully uh, between us and a handful of other people, uh, we can keep this thing going. Absolutely, George. I really appreciate what you guys are doing. I was really impressed and inspired by your interview with the Black Lives, activists, uh, Black Lives Matter activists from Seattle and that collective. I really appreciate that kind of on the street, cutting edge uh, reporting and the, some of the other interviews you've done. So uh, kudos to you guys. Keep up the good work. Black Lives Matter. And let's keep this uh, movement for pro-democracy and, and justice and police accountability going. This is Mark Taylor Canfield, live from Seattle. <laughs> thank you, George. I really appreciate it. And I will also thanks. share. I will also share what you guys are doing. So thanks so much. I appreciate it so much. And thank you all for watching this week. We'll see you next week on Washington and Me.